thank you all for for inviting me this morning. I'm here on. Um, it was set up by Larry Larry Fire, who's a member of your group, obviously. And um, I have to say, this is the certainly the most technically oriented oriented group that I've spoken to about my book, Blind Bombing. Um, I'm a Boston boy myself, though I'm in live in Virginia for the past 35 years. Uh, but I was born there, as I'm sure many of you were, not all. Um, I had three uncles that went to MIT, as I know many of you did. Uh, but I broke the family mold. I went north to uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, where I met Larry. And uh, we went through Dartmouth undergraduate and the Thayer School of Engineering there together. We became great pals. Let me just get into this and then you, you can ask me anything you like. Um, let me tell you first how I came to write Blind Bombing, which incidentally, I was surprised to learn this uh, the summer uh, was a silver medal, silver medalist in uh, world history category in uh, the independent publishers and book awards annual thing. A, a colleague and I uh, signed on to Raytheon many years ago. Raytheon had a contract with the FAA for a large screen, flat screen uh, graphics display. Uh, this was for air traffic control um, in, the, in the major uh, control centers. It was a new generation display and for the FAA, uh, lots of tight linearities, uh, especially on a flat face tube, you face with those um, uh, necessaries. And, uh, and it was a total redesign, a new redesign, first time ever, a graphics display, large screen graphics dis display, was designed with all solid state components, transistors and diodes. And um, we were there for about, three Norm, years. About what year was that? Oh boy, um, that was okay. um, around sixty. It was the, it was called the RBDE five RBDE five radar bright display. And the FAA, my goodness, uh, they were really tough at that time. Um, we we'll wonder about that now, but. Uh, they were really tight when once the thing was designed and were in production, acceptance testing was really rigorous and they just uh, wouldn't take anything that was out of spec in any way, even marginally in spec, they wouldn't accept. But anyway, after it was all over, um, my partner, and I, friend and I looked at each other and he said, we know somebody, something nobody else knows. So, why don't we go into business, which we did. We started a company with the brashness of youth. I think I was 27 and he was 28. And uh, this was during the Cold War. We find ourselves doing a lot of radar displays, radar and infrared reconnaissance displays for airborne use. Um, flat screen, uh, many of them were film recorded, were for film recording, strip film recording for uh, mapping. Um, but one problem we had, since it was state-of-the-art level, was a no, a skill, um, actually a lack of um, design guides, books, texts on uh, how to de design some of these circuits. So I did a search and I found, uh, the first thing I found and the best was a 10 volume set that most of you probably remember, the Radiation Lab series. They published right after the war, this 10 volume series on all the things that they developed and designed at the Rad Lab. One of those books was on displays. It was a help to us. And, um, the search through the literature was really leading me in directions uh, aside of my original purpose. 
So then I was just getting interested in the subject, and, um, which I didn't know a lot about, so in the early days of radar. I found another two volume uh, set of books called Radar in World War II by Henry Gerlach. It was the two volume history of the Rad Levis itself, all the projects that they worked on, um, what they did, how they did it, how, what successes they had. It was fa really fascinating. Uh, and, and it described their, all the accomplishments of, of the scientists. And I learned that one gadget, um, one radar in particular, developed there at the Rad Lab, called the H2X, was installed in a small number of 8th Air Force B-17s uh, stationed in England during the war. I say small number, I mean, at the time of D-Day, there were probably 3,000 B-17s spread around England in 50, about 50 different bomb groups. Um, whereas at the time of D-Day, there were no more than, there were maybe a hundred of these planes. Hold on, led, Mary, led, hold on. Sorry? They led the formations. Um, so I was just getting more interested in this. I, I had an uncle who was a B-17 navigator. And I called him and I said, Stanley, um, I'm reading about this, this um, radar, special radar, H2X, sometimes called a Mickey, that was installed in a lot of these, um, some of these, a few of these B-17s in the 8th Air Force. Did you ever run across one? Did you ever know anybody uh, who was a, a Mickey operator? Um, I'd love to talk to him if I could, because I was just getting interested in this as a story to be written. So there's a silence on the line. And then, he, and then I hear Norman. I flew the first H2X off the production line to England to begin my combat tour. I was a Mickey operator. So here's uh, just a trail that had become, become in simple curiosity it leads me to my own uncle. In less than a month, I located him. I was living in Concord at the time, Massachusetts, located in the next town, Lincoln, the fellow who was the project leader on that particular radar. Um, his name might be familiar to some of you, George Valley. After the Rad Lab was closed down when the war ended, he was instrumental in starting the Lincoln Labs. Um, he was at one time chief scientist for the US Air Force out in the 50s after it. Uh, and he plays an important part in my book, certainly. He was also instrumental in the early days of designing the Bemuse system. And the makings of a little known story that had been pretty much ignored by popular historians writing for a general audience. The top secret invention overcame, I found, I believe, the two biggest obstacles to D-Day. And scarcely everyone has, scarcely no one has ever heard of this thing, the resonant cavity magnetron. Um, let me show you that. Uh, no. Steve, help, what am I? Ah, okay. Um, this is the gadget upon which all those microwave radars were, de were designed. Resonant cavity magnetron was disclosed uh, that is unit number 12, that particular one. Unit number 12 of the very first 12 units ever made, production prototypes in England. During the war, they were in this country by Raytheon, by Westinghouse, I think one more company, there were over a million of them made. Um, that was unit number 12 of the first 12 built, and it was brought here by a mission, a British mission, the Tizard mission to uh, Henry Tizard was a 
um, one of the top scientists in England, and they brought with it other brilliant inventions that they had that they they were all secret, top secret stuff, but they were at war in, by 39. Um, this was invented in uh, November by two men, Randall and Boot, at the University of Birmingham in uh, November of 1939. They were already at war, Britain was. And um, they didn't have the wherewithal, the parts, the time, the manpower to really finish the design of some of these things and make them useful during the war to helpfully, to helpfully win the war. Um, so they sent this mission over. There was um, radar techno, um, there was jet plane technology. Um, there was Loran that they had started, they called it G. Um, this unit sits currently at, at the Canada Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa. It's small, it could be held on the palm of a man's hand. It, in operation, it's surrounded by a magnet. And I'll talk about that in a second. In fact, let's look at that one. It's basically, it's a cylinder of solid copper bored out. Those holes that are bored through it are uh, the cavities. In the center, you see the cathode and the cathode leads. And to the right, you see the output uh, connection. So it's in a way, it's like a whistle that you blow, those old penny whistles that you blow. Air travels by a slot, sets up a vibration, a resonance. And uh, this was designed to resonate at a bandwidth of 10 centimeters in the microwave range. Um, the magnet gets, um, they applied heat to the cathode, obviously, boil off electrons. The magnet applies heat. I don't know, yeah, I can show you. Can you see my, my um, moving around on the image? Can yes, you see? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, a space in here between the cathode and this is the anode. The co so copper block is the anode. So it boils electrons off. The magnets make those electrons kind of whirl around this empty space here as they're being attracted to the anode by about a kilovolt. 10 kilovolts, I'm not, 10 kV, yeah. So, so uh, the magnet is not shown in this diagram? No, it is not shown, but it surrounds that block. And as, they, as the electrons whiz by these slots, slot, slot into the cavities, sets up this resonance, resonance in the cavities, resonance, uh, uh, these electrons leak into the main body of it, and, uh, and they come out, the output lead to the antenna. So that's the resonant cavity magnetron. To me, in my view, it was the most important invention in the winning of the war. Uh, that's a strong statement. Uh, I'll argue for it. Yeah, I mean, the atomic bomb, you think of, that was a, a literally an earth-shaking invention, but it didn't win the war. It ended it abruptly. And in so doing, certainly saved thousands upon thousands of Allied lives from having to invade the Japanese mainland. Uh, you can think of the brilliant mathematical achievement by breaking the Enigma code and building uh, those units to, but again, I don't consider that an invention. So I stand by what, I, I don't think there's anything to compare to the new invention on the eve of the war uh, that was most influential in the winning of the war. The Allied, according to what most of us know, from the history books. The Allied strategy for getting to D-Day was to strategically bomb Germany's war-making infrastructure, production plants, uh, transportation, railroad, marshalling yards, uh, uh, energy sources, 
uh, oil refineries. Then land troops and supplies on the Normandy beachhead and fight their way on to Berlin and victory. But that overarching account really ignores the fact that without this new invention, D-Day as we know it, January 6, 1944, would not have occurred that way. The resonant cavity magnetron improved the performance of radar thousands fold as radar was then known. It operated able, made it able to operate at much higher frequencies. And it turned out really to be the, it was the key that unlocked the promise of radar that radar scientists around the world were seeking, but hadn't yet found, totally unknown to the enemy. All the developed, all the warring nations had radar, Japan, Germany, Britain, US, operated at much lower frequencies, bandwidths of like 50, 50 meters, 10 meters, it required huge antennas, some as big as the side of a barn, uh, large power hungry equipment, uh, good for you, very useful certainly, and the Brits made great use of it for fixed um, defensive ground installations, but certainly not mobile offensive warfare. Let's take a look at January 1, 1944. After four years of bombing for the Brits, nearly two years by the American Eighth Air Force, the preconditions for uh, the preconditions for D-Day had not yet been achieved. They were insistent on having D-Day that summer. Yet, just six months later, when the Allies put 150,000 men on the Normandy beaches, but all their equipment and their weapons and their tanks, there was scarcely a German plane in the sky to oppose them. Uh, on January 1, the industries were still humming along. The Air Force, German Air Force was still a potent threat six months later. The few German planes that were still operational had no spare parts to repair them, no fuel to run them, scarcely any experienced pilots to fly them. They'd been shot down. So considering the earlier years of bombing by the RAF, the United States Army Air Force, and not getting the job done, how was it done in just six months? On January 1944, the Air Force changed their protocols. Never knew about that. Um, Got to understand that statistics showed, and here's the reason why they hadn't got the job done. There was something in the way. Anyone guess what that was? The weather. The stormy, perpetually overcast, miserable European weather, especially in the winter, early spring, late fall. During those years of Allied bombing, the statistics showed at that point on January, they knew there were 70 to 80% of all planned bombing missions were scrubbed or recalled. Heavy bomber formations were able to complete their missions only like seven days a month. No wonder. They'd get back to a target and that they bombed two weeks ago and it'd be up and running again, repaired. By late 1943, the Air Force brass uh, in Europe knew they had to do something different. Or they would be losing their planes, the B-17s and 24s, to the Pacific Theater. So they listened to their scientists who told them that they had a radar they could put in a B-17, could lead the formations, navigate to the targets, drop the first bombs and marker flares, and all the rest of them would just drop their bombs on the markers, all the rest of the planes behind. This plan was fiercely resisted by many uh, Air Force leaders, certainly by the veteran airmen in Europe already. 
Let me show you the Pathfinder plane, so-called Pathfinder plane with the radar installed, leading the formations. You'll note that pod, the radar sticking. They, they took the belly gunner turret out and they replaced it with uh, the radome with the rotating antenna. The operator sat on the starboard side, the side uh, right over the wing with his equipment. And he dropped the first bombs and flares. Hey, can you, can you use your, oh, I was gonna ask uh, you to use your arrow to point at the dome, at the pod. Right there. See, there used to be a belly gunner there. They removed the belly gunner's turret and they replaced it with that radio. Okay. And the operator sat right up here over the wing. It looks like it would drag on the ground when you land. Um, no, well, they had, let's see. No, didn't, didn't. They landed front, front, front wheels first, and they were came down to here. Okay, on that. Good, thanks. Thank you. This is a scope image of the H two X taken just before D Day of the Normandy coast. You see. That's uh, Cherbourg uh, on, on the upper left, and um, boy, oh boy, Le Havre to the right. You've seen, I mean, you, it's the, the, the coastline, wa the water land interface is gorgeous, perfectly clear. You, uh, bridges, rivers showed up beautifully. Um, cities were big white blobs. Of different shapes. Um, so what made that microwave radar so superior? Okay, we talked about the higher frequencies, which means much smaller antennas can be installed in planes <clears throat> and the detection of much smaller objects. Uh, we're talking about a 10 centimeter wavelength on those signals. Uh, so obviously, much greater detail, uh, d distinguishing individual planes from a whole mass of planes. <coughs> Looking over the water, you said over the water, it could that that radar could detect a periscope in the vastness of the ocean. Uh, the current, the other lower frequency radars would be hard pressed to find to see an, a whole U-boat sitting on the surface of the water, find it at any useful distance, find it at any distance. But here's, here's the big thing. Before the resonant cavity magnetron, the maximum power, and, and we were, uh, US was trying, country, designers were trying to raise the frequency and they were designing circuits. We designed at MIT, they were working on it, designing circuit high frequency, uh, uh, amplifiers and, and IFs and um, and transmitters. The most power they could transmit at that frequency was 20 watts. They were using a klystron. Remember the, the old klystrons that the Varian brothers in, invented, designed over on the West Coast. It certainly, it's enough to do research and to see things that nearby, but not a useful radar, not enough power. Resonant cavity magnetron invented in, so I said, uh, December, November of 1940. It took the poor Brits four months to even get it in a breadboard. I mean, they were, the guys that were doing research and development in Britain when they needed a condenser, they often had to take two cans of different sizes and move them back and forth until they found the capacitance they wanted. And that's, that's they, were, they had nothing to work with. Where was I? So four months later, they finally got it up on a breadboard 
uh, all put together uh, on, the, uh, and they tested it. And it was incinerating just about every load they put on it. They were ge generating 30,000 watts of power with the very first magnetron. Surpassed their wildest dreams. I mean, compare, like, compared to a 20 watt bulb, That'd be like comparing a 20 watt bulb to three carbon arc searchlights, right? huge. The first obstacle actually that the microwave radar conquered were the U-boats. Here's Britain, an island nation, needing supplies, everything by sea. And uh, the U-boats were, the predations were horrendous. Many U.S. officials, military and political, believed that Britain would fall. Uh, Germany's plan was to invade Britain in September of 1940. They had, they had swept over Europe in May and June of that year, 40. Carl, Carl Dernitz was the commander of the U-boat fleet. And he boasted that he could win the war with the U-boats alone. His goal was to sink 700,000 tons of shipping every month. That's more than the Allies could replace. In the first six months of 1942 alone, U-boats sank 585 ships, over 3 million gross tons, an average of two ships every day. And the time at the time, there were only 35 U-boats in combat at any one time. Dernitz wa wanted 100. There were months when U-boats were sinking that kind of tonnage without the loss of a single U-boat. I mean, that's a very efficient weapon. How to locate and destroy them was the problem, and the radar scientists uh, hastily designed and built what they called ASV radars, ASV-10, ASV-10 centimeters, which they installed in British Coastal Command planes. Um, they could detect, as I said, uh, uh, certainly a conning tower uh, sticking out of the water. Uh, no other radar in the world could do that. When submerged, the U-boats were powered by storage batteries for, for, uh, for propelling them, as well as all the operating systems in the U-boat. They would surface every night under the cover of darkness to recharge those batteries with their diesel engines. Suddenly, at night, a U-boat on the surface would find itself bathed in light from above and the bombs and the, and the depth charges would fall. Dernitz wondered if the, you know, the Allies could have some new special kind of radar. And he went to his scientists and his scientists told him, radar can't possibly do that. And so microwave radar and location and destruct, destruct, destruction it eventually pushed the U-boats from the shipping lanes the fact that they could decode messages from the Germans was a great help. It told, uh, it told the Air Forces where to look. Uh, but eventually they were pushed out of the shipping lanes and, and Britain had, and the Battle of Britain, the Battle of the Atlantic was won. Darnitz, in his memoir after the war, admits, he says, he wrote, that those men who designed those radars were, quote, the saviors of their country. Had the U-boats not been conquered by microwave radar and had Britain fell, where would the Allies have launched any kind of a massive invasion from? The rest of Europe was either occupied, uh, enemy occupied, or was neutral. So let's go back to the weather. That's the second major obstacle 
D-Day six months away and requisites not yet accomplished. Yeah, the U.S. Army Air Force had this great northern bomb site. But if it couldn't see the ground, it couldn't bomb effectively. And the, the still factory is still producing. The Luftwaffe is still a potent threat. They knew they had to get into the air more often, bomb targets relentlessly, and force. And this was a big part of that strategy now, they realized. They had to force the Luftwaffe into the air so they had a chance of shooting them down. So at the beginning of uh, January 1944, the 8th Air Force totally revamped their bombing protocols. They put the radar equipped plane in front. On January, on the, at the beginning of January, they had 12 of those planes in, in England. They were hand-built radars built by George Valley's technicians in a big hangar at East Boston Airport, installed in the B-17s there. Uh, they put them in front of the formations leading the way. Uh, let's see, by the end of January, there was one more, uh, uh, the first production model. That's the one my uncle took over there. By the end of February, there were probably a total of 20. Uh, but it was increasing. Let me show you this slide. This is just before D-Day. Uh, Bombers over Hamburg, obviously totally overcast. And those black smudges you see bubbling through the overcast are burning oil refineries, oil, oil storage tanks. Truly blind bombing. The plan was fraught with startup problems, uh, equipment failures, crew failures. Uh, they didn't know how to work together. Um, but by, but by, and it was resisted fiercely by a lot of the veteran airmen. And some of the reasons were legitimate, some were not. Certainly, um, and, and why they had ignored it for so long is because the, the accuracy of the radar bombing was not equal to the Norden. But if you can get into the air three or four times, three, three times as many, as many missions as you, can, as you were before, um, you would certainly get ahead of the game. There was no prior combat experience like this. Uh, they didn't teach anything like this at West Point. And uh, these guys were just by learning by the seat of their pants how to use this new Gadget, I mean, for example, my uncle, when he was selected to be a trained, to be trained, he's pulled out of a group of navigators, ready to become a replacement crew, be sent over with the first 10 that were trained in, uh, at Langley Field on this. Uh, he had never heard the word radar in his life. He didn't know what it was. But slowly, I mean, they, they worked things out. The crews learned what the navigator needed. He learned how to work with the crews. And they decided, finally realized they had to have fixed crews. So, the, so they worked as a team, a new concept. Uh, and after a couple months of trial and error, some high level meetings between the stakeholders, uh, they got things worked out. The newer crews, the newer navigators, and the other planes, they love the new radar. I mean, anybody, any, uh, they're doing their navigation by uh, did reckoning, and they're just so they could keep a track of where they were in case they had to drop out or get back. And so they're all dead reckoning in weather like this, and any of you that have been, ever sailed on a, in the open water or flown a plane know how if you don't have a good fix to begin with, or well, good fixes every once in a while, your dead reckoning errors just multiply. So they love them. So to answer the question, what did the resident cavity magnetron accomplish? Many things, and uh, millions were manufactured, as I said. 
a lot of them, well, a lot of them for shipboard, uh, ships detecting other ships, ships probably in bad weather. I mean, it must have been a help in station keeping on the ocean uh, to them and in their, and in their gunnery. Uh, uh, gun directors and in Europe uh, also many used uh, there was a, a, a really ubiquitous system called the uh, SCR 584 it was a ground-based radar radar designed early on at Rad Lab and uh, they finally uh, used it, they used it for to lock on to approaching aircraft and to automatically uh, aim aim the guns. But to me, uh, the uh, microwave radar was most when it comes to winning the war most influential in overcoming those two obstacles: the U-boats and the weather. And the weather. Uh, we're fine. Here's a radar navigator, Uncle Stanley. He's pointing at, he's holding a big piece of, relatively big piece of flak, uh, pointing at a hole in the fuselage that burst through, narrowly missed him. He was on a bombing run at the time. This was uh, a couple of weeks after D-Day. Um, it, it damaged his equipment, uh, but he, somehow managed to manage to get over the target, release his bombs. Uh, for, there was a, uh, every once in a while on some of these flights, uh, some top brass would go, major or general, would sit on the co-pilot seat on the lead plane uh, just to observe. They had to know what was going on. So once, you know, on that mission, there was a general, at least he wound up as a general, may have been a major at the time, colonel. Uh, he was there, and when they got back, he put uh, Stanley in for his second Distinguished Flying Cross. The experiences of uh, George Valley, Uncle Stan, and, and some of the other really fascinating characters uh, that I came across. Uh, Stan, Stan grew up in Cambridge, actually, not far from MIT, while this was going on. Uh, he was a homeboy, probably never been more than 100 miles from Cambridge in his life, when early in 1940 he was caught up in the peacetime draft. Uh, graduated high school, and as expected of him, went to work. Uh, to help support the family. He was going to uh, Bentley's at night. It wasn't a college at that time. It was just a two-year. He was working for his certificate in uh, accounting, as his elder brother did 10 years earlier, my father. Um, Stanley in a big circle and in another life, and a couple of years later, came across Valley and the, and the Magnetron. Uh, all these men, this small band, a small band of scientists and the warriors, uh, they worked together against a lot of odds, against apathy, uh, resistance of their own military establishments and had to overcome all that before they could actually get, get to war and overcome the enemy. So I think, I think that gives you the overall picture I tried um, of what this book is all about and what my, that bug I had in my head. I thank you so very much for listening, for having me. Try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. You know, you remind me of a story <clears throat> when I was working for the Department of the Air Force. I had to go down to Vanden for uh, as an engineer, not as a, uh, in the service, systems engineer, f f uh, via Haskam Air Force Base. Anyway, I went up to Vandenberg Air Force Base and they took us for a tour of all the missiles on there. 
and outside on the uh, coastline, there was this humongous ship from World War II that was just rusting away. So, of course, everybody on the tour bus was asking, what is that ship doing out there? Well, it's around the time of World War II when this new f uh, f uh, fangled radar came out and the captain didn't trust it and didn't like it and he didn't use it. And it was a really foggy, rainy, uh, uh, it was stormy weather. And what did he do? He ran into some rocks. So that was the first inclination that I got from the people, the older folks, if you will, uh, really not trusting technology. <laughs> Right, there's a story about, um, about General Marshall. Uh, the, the Air Force guys at that time, early on, were younger, tended to be younger and more uh, thinking ahead more. And um, Hap Arnold, I'm sorry, I have a little dog in the house and she's yapping. And if I let her out, we won't hear her. Would you excuse me for a moment? Yeah. All right. I got two grandkids and my door is shut and I can still hear them. I gotta tell them to be quiet. Because <laughs> I can't hear you. It should have been at my place when the construction was going on upstairs. We can have a com we can have a contest. Uh, who has the most ambient noise? Uh -huh. How about let's have a contest who, a contest who can have the least for the longest? I say just turn mute, off the mic and then it doesn't bother. I say turn off the microphone of the dog. Well, when it's the presenter, you can't mute. <laughs> mute the dog. Well, well Norman is, uh, is is out there. Oh, well, he's back now. Uh, I'll, let me tell you another story about uh, resistance. On, on the part of, of the, the brass to technology or, or to science. Um, my stepfather had been involved in, uh, well, in, in a number of the, te in installing a number of the technology. He worked in, uh, at the end of the war, he worked <clears throat> in uh, the Secretary of War's office uh, directly under uh, the Secretary of War. Um, and the, one of the big problems was how to clear minefields. And the bomber people thought, well, what we will do is we can, we'll just bomb the minefield. And then we will, you know, and that'll clear them out. Well, that, that was a, in, in its own, even in those days, a problem that could be solved mathematically. Hmm. And, and the operations research guys went to work and said, no, you can't bomb, you, you can't clear these minefields uh, the successfully by, by bombing. But they insisted on an experiment. And therefore they had big, big flotillas of bombers bomb some of the minefields. And only then did they, when it didn't work, uh, did the brass go along with the idea that they wouldn't bomb. Of course, they were also wedded to the idea that bombing would solve all problems. They sure would, they sure were. Oh, that story about Marshall I was telling you. Uh, a Hap Arnold, who was uh, commander of the, of the Army Air Force at the time, he, uh, he took, he said, he said, General Marshall, I want you to have lunch with some people I know. So he took them to lunch with um, some of the top scientists in DC. Maybe Veneva Bush was one of them, or at any rate, after the lunch, and they were talking about things as you would at lunch. Uh, and after the lunch, Marshall said to Arnold, what on earth are you doing with those people, these civilian scientists? And, and Arnold said, using them, using their minds, their brains, they, they, they know things that we can't possibly know or, or do. It was just inconceivable to these older guys, the establishment, that, they, that civilian scientists could 
be of any use to them. That's why it was, it was so hard getting these things accepted. But, but, you, but you know, it's a, it's a tribute to Vannevar Bush that he understood that from his experience in World War I. He understood how resistant the military was to using technology. And in 1938, he went to Washington mainly in order to get a channel through Roosevelt to set up the control of American science and adapt it to technology and also control the interface to the military to make sure that the stuff got used. Exactly, you're absolutely, and that's a big part of that, the beginning of, the, of my book is, is him meeting with Roosevelt, him setting up the National Defense Research Committee Council um, with, with those, those realizing that, uh, and when they set up the Rad Lab, they knew that, and the military didn't want them to do that, industry didn't want them to do it, to actually build the first few, have, have a, an ability to produce the first useful uh, units so they could understand what the problems were when they were finally put into use. Uh, but that's the way they did it, and yeah. Well, the, 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 first, the first Rad Lab was really set up by Alfred Loomis, uh, with Alfred Loomis's private money. Uh, and it wasn't only, it wasn't until we finally began to look like there was gonna be a war that we got federal money. I have a whole chapter on Loomis, yeah. He was, Norman, uh, could, I, could I ask you a question on the radar? Sure. Uh, uh, first, um, about government resistance. During the Civil War, a scientist from, I think it was New York, but I'm not sure, offered his services to the uh, U.S. government for the Civil War. And Abraham Lincoln responded to him, thanking him, but saying uh, he didn't need him. He already had a scientist. <laughs> so there's a long history of that. But um, did, the, did the clouds benefit the uh, flyers as a defensive uh, mechanism once they couldn't be seen by eye? Or did the Germans uh, have enough radar to see them? You know, in a way, the clouds were a benefit and they were a danger. One of the reasons the uh, Air Force guys hated to go up in that weather was when they went up, it took them an hour just to form up before they even set out toward, toward enemy territory, into enemy territory, to get their formation side. The, formation, the purpose of the formation, of course, was defensive, so they could cover uh, attackers. Um, and, and also the other reason for it was for to get a precise uh, bomb load drop. And, but it took a long time to, to just for everyone to find their place, hundreds of planes in these formations see, um, and before they set out. Well, imagine doing that in miserable weather, stormy, windy, uh, going up through, uh, high elevation of clouds uh, in that weather, there were, there were collisions. There were planes lost before they ever got formed up and, and, and off toward the target. So that, that but your, up to your question, yes, it did, it did um, prevent the German Air Force from coming up. Uh, to oppose them in many cases, that's where the flak. But but they had they had you know lots of flak, and they of course could home in on them through their own radar on the formations. Norm, could you shed some background on um, how come the United States got the magnetron from um, yeah. England? Yeah. Um, It only happened because they were at war, because they were so under the gun, because they were so under supplied with everything, including manpower. Uh, they, they had been ideas uh, floated earlier to show the Americans uh, some of this stuff so they could get going on it. Churchill was against it. Others were against it. Our secrets, show our secrets. Um, but by the time uh, Germany rolled over Europe. Uh, 
uh, amassing troops on the northern French border to invade England in September. They, didn't, they, they had a plan to invade England in September of 1940. Um, so where am I going with this, Larry? Yeah, why? Um, why? So they put this this uh, mission together, the Tizard mission. Henry Tizard led it. There was uh, uh, scientists from each technology that they were bringing. They brought over samples. They brought over all the production uh, uh, blueprints uh, for making the stuff. And they, and they had a series of meetings around DC and, and around the country ultimately uh, with American scientists, leading scientists, leading military guys. Um, and that's how it came. They, uh, they disclosed this thing to, to um, Loomis and some of the MIT guys. Uh, and Loomis's suite in one of the hotels in DC one night, and they just astounded our scientists. What Two days later. Little, uh Noam, wasn't there a little horse trading between Churchill and Roosevelt? Because Churchill was in dire need of support and uh, basically uh, gave him the, um, the magnetron uh, to try to get some support from Roosevelt, even though the country was totally against getting involved. But uh, Roosevelt ended up, uh, by devious means, was able to get them some of the uh, supplies they needed. Is that true? No, I, I, I have never read anything that tied the, the magnetron to that. To that, Roosevelt and Churchill had a close relationship. Churchill was priming Roosevelt early, from early on, writing to him, communicating with him, uh, and and he had the power of persuasion. There's no doubt about that. And Roosevelt was definitely um, pro-Britain. Uh, we were, yeah, we were neutral. And yeah, we talk, I mean, Roosevelt was hemmed in by the isolationists. He couldn't do very much because he promised not to send our, our, your, our sons to war. But um, I never heard that tied to, no, I, I think that was a, some of the things that Roosevelt did, at least that he thought up out of his own head, uh, he just tried to do, he tried to go as far as he could without getting everyone in the government upset. He did get everyone in the government upset many times by giving things to England that they thought we ought, we ought to hang on to for ourselves because we might be needing them ourselves soon. But but he, but he did uh, that, and I never read it. Yeah. Didn't read anything about that um, as being tied to the magnetron. Magnetron wasn't, came wasn't. with several other things, and a, a separate group. Churchill it was absolutely gave it his blessing, and they brought that stuff over here. And there's a it's really some a funny story about um, in handling the magnetron between uh, one of the English radar scientists, the one who's most responsible actually for designing and getting that chain home system they had built around their coastline to warn them of incoming German bombers. He came with it, he came with the magnetron. Uh, only heard about the magnetron shortly before they came. And he's the one that picked out that unit that I showed you to bring he went up to GEC to pick it out. <laughs> and here they have been, they had been so, um, the Brits had been so jerky about our security and, and, and he had to read how he got the magnetron and brought it back to London. And uh, I mean, it would have made any secret service man's hair curl. It was like Keystone Cops. I mean, he's, he had no way of getting to the plant. There were no cars available. So he took public transportation. And when he chose that magnetron, Britain's greatest secret, 
he went back to this building in London with it sitting on his lap in a, on public transportation. Uh, brought it to the ship finally before the, uh, uh, it's just, it was ludicrous how it was supposed to go on the hotel safe overnight and it was too big, the box was too big. Um, there was many other things they were bringing, had all the documents, all the blueprints, all the secrets of Britain, and it had to be tied to the top of a cab. And then a, and then a, a guy at the airport took it on his shoulder and went rushing through the crowds uh, with this scientist <laughs> trying to keep up with it. Um, and only by seeing it on the, on the guy's shoulder bobbing, weaving his way through the crowds of his train to get him to the ship on time. It was um, some funny moments. Well, you know, uh, of course, the, it was the Brits who also brought what was a crucial piece of information to the Manhattan Project that resulted in the Manhattan, you know, the so-called Maud Report. But one of the features of the whole British involvement was that they were almost an open channel to the Soviet Union. They, there was, you know, the, yeah, yeah. their top secret reports often got to the Russians before they got to the Americans. And was that also true? Of, uh, I, of, of, if so, I never heard, of all the reading I've done about this, I've never heard the Russians latching on to the, the radar technology. I never did. But there's one thing that's quite interesting is uh, one of my first jobs out of school as an electronics engineer was with Raytheon Bedford. And I was working which, on which, giant, which, which Raytheon was that? Uh, Bedford, the Missile Systems Division. In Bedford, okay. Bedford, yeah. yeah. And we were building the uh, the Hawk, and they were looking for a, I don't know. Anyway, the point I'm getting at is here I'm working for a Raytheon, and they do make these kind of microwave tubes in Waltham but they didn't have one to go on the Hawk. We had to get a tube from Great Britain, or they did. Really? And we could make the Hawk work. And then finally the Magnetron, you know, came out of product, design and production and we got it. So we finally got a 200 watt CW Hawk system radar. <laughs> in, uh, in, in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh -huh. So, they were still, yeah, they were still using some of that uh, Rad Lab equipment in Korea, that SCR 584 I talked about. Uh, they used, and they used it in the U.S. They used it uh, to, uh, to, to uh, during the Cold War to warn us about Russian bombers heading this way. Mm, I'll tell you another thing too, is later on in life, I worked for a Navy project what company anyway, Raytheon, it was, was ITT Gilfillan was making the radar, but they were using a Raytheon cross field amplifier. It's a very interesting too, because you get a Maggie and an amplifier and all this waveguide plumbing and regular water cooling plumbing. So it's, it's huh. a complicated device, you know, but my point is, that the design engineers at you know in Waltham were great. You know they taught me a lot because I didn't know anything. The only thing I knew was vacuum tubes, and uh, uh, the the only thing that uh, the reason why I went to the Raytheon facility in the first place is the company could not make these uh, crossfield amplifiers, right, you know, one after the other that looked the same. They all they all came out different. You know, so being an operations type guy, because I like to design it and build it and see what the hell you have to do so you can make the thing, you know, in production. So it, they come out as twins, not as distant cousins. Right. Well, I did that, you know, for the production line or so-called assembly line, you know, in, in Waltham at the power division. And the engineers asked me to go up to the industrial engineering manager and tell them what I wanted to do. I said, yeah, it's very simple. You get various processes. The next guy down the line is your customer. Give him a damn good product so he can go to the next step and do it right the first time. They didn't have it documented step by step by step, and they couldn't reproduce the thing. And this is a complicated device. So within six months, 
the Navy was happy with ITT Gilfillan and ITT was happy with Raytheon giving him a good tube. Was Spencer at that, at your lab? He, was, uh, he wasn't there at that time, but I know where... Uh, yeah, uh, at mean, Waltham. He, was, he was at Waltham, was he? Waltham, yeah. It was a Waltham facility, yeah. I mean, it's a great place to work. I mean, I was there as an engineering rep, and mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the general manager, when I, you know, you know, left to go to another project with ITT, he said, if you don't want a job, come see me. He says, you saved my neck. I says, well... I says, even if it wasn't my job, the en en engineers, like other engineers, we want to get the job done, and we did. Because what I, my basic philosophy on process management, if you will, process control, works for everybody, not for one project. Yeah. There's a funny story about Percy Spencer. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard but of him. Back. Spencer Lab. Yeah. Named after him, Spencer was working with one of these magnetrons. He was probably involved in the production of the design. But um, he noticed he had a chocolate bar in his pocket and he noticed it was melting. And he said, hmm. And that was the birth of the radar range. Uh, that was, Raytheon was the first one to come out with a uh, radar range, so-called. You know, uh, we radar. keep talking about Raytheon. I thought, I, I didn't realize this until relatively recently, but apparently Vannevar Bush was one of the co-founders of Raytheon in the, in the yeah. 1920s. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. But you know that that story about the chocolate bar. Yeah, they told me that. I thought it was funny as hell. And you know, I'll tell you something else too. Yeah, you said ten thousand volts. You know, for the Crossfield amplifier, it's twenty thousand volts plus, and a lot of amperage. You know, and I'll tell you, I had a lot of respect for the uh, test setups there, because you had to be damn careful what you were doing. <laughs> But the precision of the cathode inside the tube, it's a piece of jewelry. Is it? And the mathematics is quite complicated. The physics, huh. you know. Yeah. So um, we headed up the uh, radar development at the Rad Lab. I'm sorry? Who headed up the radar development at the <sighs> Rad Lab? Oh, I don't know. The radar, well, Loomis was designated by the NDRC, by Vannevar Bar Bush's committee as the, um, to head it up, to head up the microwave developments. Uh, and it was at his home, his home lab was better than most university, research university labs. Uh, and that's where MIT boys would go in the summer to work on their radar circuitry and their, uh, but um, where am I going with this? Your question, Larry? Uh, who, who headed up the headed um, up? Uh, RAD um, Lab, uh, radar yeah, development yeah, of the RAD yeah. Lab? Um, yeah, the director was, the director was did Loomis Bridge, control it, or he, did he just fund it, Norm? No, no, he didn't just, he didn't, fund, well, he did fund a lot of things, uh, including a lot of Lawrence's work on the West Coast. Mike but, Alexander no. gave the right answer. It was Lee Dubridge. Lee Dubridge, that was it. Yeah, he man. became president of Caltech after the war. Lee Dubridge was uh, recommended, um, I think uh, my mind is shutting down now. Uh, I've had a work, um, the cyclotron man. Um, Lawrence? Lawrence? Lawrence. Lawrence. Lawrence played a big role in staffing the, the, the Rad Lab. They wanted him to lead that group. Uh, Loomis wanted him to be the leader. But he was totally wrapped up in a cyclotron, uh, which is good. 
Um, and so he said, I will help you staff this lab because Loomis had been very good to him and got him some money and, and put him in touch with important people that were really helping him. So they had a great relationship, Loomis and um, Lawrence. So Lawrence uh, truly, uh, he had a lot to do with, with uh, suggesting he sent one of his best students over there. He knew Loomis would probably call her him anyway, but he offered him. And um, that was a close collaboration. You know, I, I read someplace or heard basically that the, um, in the development of the atomic bomb, they were trying to get key personnel and uh, certain personnel at the Rad Lab was too critical for that. The Rad Lab, so they never ended up going in and working on the atomic bomb. The other thing that might be interesting, and everybody's here from Boston, is some of the experiments that were done at MIT and shooting across the river and stuff like that. Can you want to touch on that, Norm? Is doing what across the river? Yeah, they did experiments from MIT, did they not? And yeah, it, they had a they had a roof lab. They built a lab labs on the roof, um, covered you know covered so that nobody could tell what the heck they were doing. And yeah, they were using them to, uh, that's how they were testing their early radars, um, see what they could see. Uh, they hid, all the antennas were hidden in those roof labs and the equipment. And they were, they were watching cars. Uh, they were watching cars travel down what, near the, the store drive wasn't built at the time. And it was uh, right by the river. And they could time them. They could tell how fast they were going. Hmm. I, I was going to add about of, Laura. There was a certain amount of cost flow. I don't know that it was very large between uh, the atomic bomb and uh, the project and, uh, and, and yeah. the Rad Lab. I, I uh, think some of those men at the Rad Lab actually wound up at Los Alamos. Yeah. I, I had I had a colleague who was had, had just graduated from college and was working at the Rad Lab. And he told me a story um, about Hans Beta. Um, Beta came and gave a lecture at the Rad Lab about uh, some, about some microwave plumbing. And in the course of doing that, you know, and then Beta, by the way, just uh, was became or already was the head of the theory division at Los Alamos. Um, and Beta made the comment, well, if you drill holes in the side of the, in the side of the waveguide right here, I don't know what exactly what he was doing, you can, you can extract some signal. And um, my friend, Mr. Paul Sergallon, if any of you know him, said bit by bit, people started leaving the lecture and heading to their labs to try it out. And it became known as the beta hole, which I believe was probably the beginning of the, uh, the uh, coupling. The beginning of what? No, the, the microwave coupler, directional coupler. Oh, the coupler. I'm oh. guessing. I don't know that for sure. I was just going to add about Lawrence that, you know, the, I, I'd heard the story about how he refused to go to the Rad Lab because he wanted to stay with his research at Berkeley. But when the Bush and Conant said, no, we need you to develop electromagnetic separation for the atomic bomb, then he signed on full, full, full body. And I, I hadn't realized that he was so important in the radar. He was very important in persuading Bush and people to go ahead in America to make the atomic bomb. So he's a very, he was in both places. There was, have you got me? There was a conversation earlier about the adaption of technology. 
and just a slightly different perception. Uh, I was with the Air Defense Command during the Korean War, and we had all the radar stations uh, on the lawn, the Arctic Circle, and uh, flew the fighter interceptors. And we lived on the technology. We flew, we flew 24 7, didn't make any difference what the weather was, didn't make any difference whether you could see or not. You were just relying on your instruments and your radar to, to uh, accomplish your mission and get home safe. Were you on the doom line, George? Uh, I was part of a command that I was in, but uh, uh, I avoided that by three days, and that's a story for another day. Uh, well, I, I wrote an article on how the do line came to be, so I'm interested in somebody who actually had something to do with it. I was very happy not to. They flew you in. They flew you in in April. Uh, there were seven people on the station. Uh, they flew you out in October for two weeks. They flew you back in. You spent another six months with the same seven people in one little building, and you did that for two years. It made the pay, it made the pandemic look like child's play. <laughs> it makes jail look pleasant. Ending up on the do line can be a, a a matter of life circumstances. When I grew up in Quincy, and at the time um, I was I was younger, but there were two older kids. Uh, were great pitchers, one from Quincy named Bobby Minor, and another one from, I think, Malden or Medford, uh, named Billy Mambouquet. And Billy Mambouquet, they, they were pitching Pony League, and Bobby Minor had like nine no-hitters, and Billy Mambouquet had like nine no-hitters. And, and so they came down, it was the Medford Malden team, whatever it was, they came down to Adams Field in Quincy. It was a big game, and well, a lot of people there, including me. And uh, Bobby Miner pitched into the ninth a no hit a no hitter or a one hitter and Billy Mambouquet uh, had uh, had the same and in the tenth inning Bo uh, Bobby Miner gave up a run and uh, Billy Mambouquet won and uh, as it turned out they both went forward with their baseball careers uh, uh, Billy Mambouquet became the best left hander ever to play for the for the Red Sox and Bobby Miner hurt his arm and ended up serving in the army at the do line. <laughs> I worked on the update of the dual line. They made it from a mechanical antenna to one of these electrical antennas, or microwave antennas. The antenna stayed still, but the, you know, it, the beam was electronically rotating. <laughs> Norm, Norm, it was a fine talk. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank definitely. you very much. It was a very awesome. wo a wonderful you. talk. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It really brought back a lot of memories, too, you know. I'm sure it did. Because for I, I make a long, very long story sh uh, short. I married a British girl, and her uncles were in World War II. One of them in particular was a kind of a very lackadaisical, but very nice man, very, you know. He was a bombardier during World War II, you know. So we, I'd ask him a few questions, and, you know, thank God for radar, because we... Yeah, they led the way. They led yeah. the way, in, in its, in, obviously, in its development and, its, and in its use. So he was he was used to dropping bombs on flares on marker flares because they, of course, their bombing was different. I mean, our whole strategy was so trying to be precise, um, right. whereas they were going at night and just carpeting, 
Well, you know, you, you talk about precision bombing, but in fact, American policy migrated to what they called strategic bombing, which was just bomb the bejesus out of whatever was below, killing, you know, the, the whole, the Dresden bombing was actually a coordinated mission between the British and the Americans. And, uh, uh, and the Hamburg firestorm was an indicator that led uh, LeMay to use that technique in Japan to, you know, just destroy vast areas and hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, the, the, that kind of bombing is still more effective. It's killed more people than the atomic bomb. What it does is, I mean, it uses up all your facilities. I mean, all your emergency facilities, fills the hospitals. Um, it just gets everybody running around trying to help everybody else. And, and you just... Uh, everybody is then involved in the war. Well, in Dresden, they sent the British in and ignited fires and got a firestorm going. And then they timed it so that the first responders would have a chance to get there and be working on it. And then the second wave came in and, you know, devastated the, the responders. So now you've got a firestorm and there are no responders left. Question. Yeah. Has that sort of strategic bombing ever won a war. I know in Vietnam it didn't. I know that in Germany it was not responsible for winning the war. Has it ever oh. won a war? Well, I, I, I think it, when you say won, it set it up to be won. And was won, it decisive? Was it decisive? I, I, it, set, it set it up so that we could, so the conditions were right, that we could invade effectively strengthen the beachhead, bring everything in that we needed, and, and go on. Yeah, I mean the precision yeah, with our gear, you, with sort with of carpet bombing whole cities, not the precision bombing where you were hitting the manufacturing and all that, which you were talking about, Norman. You, Norman, you were talking well, about precision I, I, I think I think, Bob, that, that you ask a very good question. I don't know that there's any evidence that it ever uh, did anything but uh, sort of strengthen morale. I mean, people just got bitter. Uh, or you could say the atomic bomb I was uh, say. is clearly uh, the ultimate development of that kind of bombing. And that, I think, uh, unquestionably ended the war. I, I think, the, I think yeah. what Norm said about radar won the war, the atomic bomb ended it is a kind of a very nice summary. So, yeah, so. but Norm, Norm made another point at the beginning about uh, about the, the lack of, of German fighter planes at the time of of, uh, of the uh, Normandy invasion. The British historian Richard Overy tracked the bombing, um, and and he 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 has argued. That in fact, what happened was that the German capacity for producing fighter planes was absolutely devastated by that. And between our, our being able to have longer range fighters to shoot down and engage the German fighters, and the fact that the Germans couldn't produce fighters at the rate that they had before, and they and they also lost their pilots, meant that they that the skies were clear by the time we invaded Normandy. And it also meant that we basically had complete control of the air throughout the Normandy campaign. Yes, Mike, that, that's what we're, I think Norm was uh, referring to as precision bombing, rather than this carpet bombing of Syri uh, well, cities yeah. like the, the firestorm or in the Battle of Britain, when the, uh, when the Germans kept firing missiles and drones and all kinds of stuff and uh, it just hardened morale even more. I got you, yeah, yeah. Civilian okay. bombing, I'm questioning whether it's ever won a war. Not that I know. By the way, I, I, I think, I think yeah. the atomic bomb is an example. The bomb, the one, atomic the bomb that I know. Example, it, it ended the war, but it was already, that war was won at that point. But, so it, it, it's, you gotta be careful about the words, did it winning or ending, or what, what phase of the war are we talking about? Yeah, Charlie also been... mentioned the, uh, yeah. you know, the experience of the firebombing of, of Dresden. Uh, after the, um, the bombing of, 
of Hamburg in a firestorm there, which surprised everybody. The British started looking into the, how to actually ignite firestorms. And they looked at it, um, this is in the strategic bombing surveys, uh, I believe. Uh, and they began to link the number of continuing fires that could be set from fire bombing to whether or not there would be firestorms that would be ignited. And they, they basically scientifically worked out how you could ignite firestorms in uh, German cities. Now in Japanese cities, it would probably be a lot easier because the construction was totally different. And it was, it was flimsier and, and had much more combustible material. Yeah, with the atomic Dresden, they, by the time of Dresden, uh, the setting of firestorms would be actually gone from being an art to being a science. Yes, it was a, it was very scientific. Uh, the atomic bomb was different, Charlie, in that uh, the Japanese did not know how many we had, and it was a weapon that could completely annihilate everything. That was just incredibly terrifying. That was more a weapon of terror than it was uh, the kind of firestorm that the Japanese had already experienced and they were willing to weather. Very different. And, you know, and, and the atomic bomb too, once you drop it, the radioactivity just doesn't stop, you know? The Japanese were That's feeling another, that. Yeah. The Japanese were feeling that even initially. Well, the, the, I mean, the, the, the end of the Japanese war is a fairly complicated thing. I mean, the bomb was very important, but so was the Russian invasion of Manchuria the day after Hiroshima, uh, you know, uh, and two days before Nagasaki. Suddenly, the, the, the Japanese had been kind of hoping that the Russians might uh, broker some kind of a peace deal, and that deal was gone. And, you know, and so, and, you know, a lot of things are going on, Japanese culture, the, the emperor is asserting his authority where he had never asserted it before. It's an interesting end. The bomb is clearly very important. You know, to say it's the thing, uh, you can't ever do that. That's, that doesn't work very well. Yeah, to, 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 to Charlie's point, um, since I spent some time in the military and kind of followed what goes on there. I think that the problem is that you can't say a specific thing wins a war. It's a, it's a combination of events over a period of time that win and or lose wars. It's just like any other human activity, societal activity. It's a whole combination of things. And so to say that the atomic bomb won the war, I don't think that any historian, well, there are a lot of historians who say it did, but it's also about the same number to say that that's not what won it. Uh, it's the same thing with the Dresden bombing and so forth, it seems to me. It's not that that specifically won the war. It was something that happened during the war and the, the, uh, comp the, the country that was bombed lost the war. So who's to say whether that was did it or not? I don't know. Uh, I mean, the Megatron definitely had a tremendous effect as far oh, yeah. as the waging of the war. And that's the whole thing. How you wage the wars is whether, whether you win or lose. And again, a lot of that's based on chance, as well as for the U.S. and the Brits, the, uh, the, science, the scientists that, uh, to me, really had a tremendous effect on whether we won in Europe and thus could shift over to the Pacific to win the wars. Uh, yes. it, it's, and the same thing with Vietnam, even. Granted that the carpet bombing didn't win, but by the same token, did it? You know, what, what did it do? To me, it wasn't it wasn't worth it. But you know, that that's you know, this is a very difficult subject to to, to uh, try to many, after many. after the Dresden bombing, Churchill ordered that there be no more efforts to produce these firestorms because he was saying, you know, we've basically won the war. We want there to be something left when we get there, and so we've got to stop this massive destruction. Very different from what the Russians did as they swept through, even with conventional warfare, where they uh, had scorched earth. It was like Sherman's march through uh, the South.